Hello and welcome to September's Nementor webinar hosted by our Senior Experience uh, Optimization Consultant, Peter Kay. Today's webinar, uh, Google is a user, changed my mind, explores how you can't consider yourself truly user-centered unless you design solutions that meet the expectations of the one user that visits your site the most, Google. People discuss the relationship Google has with its users and how, if you want your site to rank well, you need to design with this relationship in mind so you can deliver truly inclusive experiences that deliver value to both humans and machines. Or to put it another way, how to be good at SEO as well as design. As always, uh, please join in uh, with the discussion in the chat, but do make sure your settings are switched both to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your messages. And if you have any questions for Pete, uh, you can submit them using the Q&A function and I'll get through as many uh, of these as I can at the end. Um, finally, we're using auto-generated captions for this webinar, uh, which sometimes can get some words muddled. Um, please do bear with us on this and we'll ensure that these are all cleaned up when the webinar is publicly available on our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Pete. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, okay, so this is quite a controversial topic. Google as a user changed my mind. Um, and it's one that I thought I would discuss and explore over the course of this webinar uh, and kind of explain to you why I think of and treat Google as a user. Um, and what, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of explore some of the key areas of SEO, um, but, but we're going to do it in a way that really kind of demystifies what can seem to many to be quite a complicated subject um, and quite ethereal. You know, SEO is always a job done by somebody else. And what I want to do is really kind of uh, illustrate to you today over the course of this webinar, uh, some of the fundamentals of SEO and how they draw really clear parallels with the work that we do uh, in user experience design and, and kind of break it down in a way that makes it accessible um, to, to, to many rather than, you know, SEOs kind of keeping the dark secrets to themselves. This is, this is about demystifying SEO and putting it into, uh, into the terms that the, the design collective will, will understand uh, a bit more universally. So uh, without further ado, let's kick things off. Uh, so, Google is a user, changed my mind. What we're going to cover in today's webinar uh, are a number of things, but um, we're going to kick off with, with the pervasive, per se, uh, it's such a long word, I can't say it properly, the pervasiveness of Google. There you go, there's a win. So, uh, we're going to explore the pervasiveness of Google uh, to, to begin with. Um, and then we're going to have a look at the value exchange. So uh, the value exchange won't be a concept um, that is particularly foreign to the design community. It's something that we look at quite a lot. So we're going to explore the Google value exchange and break that down. Uh, after we've looked at that, then we're going to get into how search works um, and really kind of illustrate the key behavioral elements involved in it and the factors that you need to think about uh, as part of uh, a design and build of a project. Uh, and then we're going to get into, you know, the, my final point, which is, you know, Google is a user. We need to treat it as such. Um, and, you know, how do we at Nementsa take that view and incorporate it into the work that we do uh, across the many design and build projects that we get involved in. So um, just in case you haven't heard uh, of who we are, uh, we are Nemensa. We're a, an experienced design agency. And, and within that, um, we have all flavors of design but we are particularly specialist in user experience design um, and accessibility information architecture, uh, the wide range. And, and we create groundbreaking experiences that make a measurable difference to the way people live, work and play. And we do that for a wide range of well-known brands, both here in the UK and, and across the world, really. Um, so 
what that means from my perspective is, you know, we're dealing with some of the biggest websites with some of the most complicated, wicked problems, um, and um, also providing them with support from an SEO perspective. So uh, who is Peter Kay? Well, that is the person that is sat in front of you right now, jabbering away. Um, and what do I do? So at Nemensa, I am the Senior Experience Optimization Consultant. Um, and that means that I lead on SEO uh, and kind of the implementation and uh, management of behavioral analytics at Nemensa. So I'm involved in putting Google Analytics and Tag Manager and all sorts of things together into, into the websites of our clients to understand what users are doing once they get to our websites. Um, what does that mean in terms of the work that I do? So my role from an SEO perspective is to kind of deconstruct the search experience uh, and really kind of understand the part that it plays in the work that Nemensa does. It's also to kind of champion the needs, to represent the needs of Google and the design and build process. There's no point in making a website and not really thinking carefully about how is that website going to be found? Uh, because what's the point of a website if it's not to be found um, fundamentally? And uh, we achieve that here at Lamenta by thinking about Google in terms of uh, a user, because we're a user-centered design agency. Uh, it helps us to kind of think of Google in these terms as part of that design and build process to meet the expectations of our clients' users. So I've talked a little bit about SEO. What is it all about? Um, you know, there's a few definitions out there, but um, there's one that I think is, is particularly good, and I thought I would share it with you today. And it comes from um, a company, an organization called Moz. And they, you might hear me speaking about them a lot today, but they uh, were very early thought leaders in the world of SEO uh, and have a huge amount of valuable and, and great resources out there for, for people to, to learn about SEO from. But they, def they, they, they say this about SEO. Uh, SEO is as much about people as it is about search engines. It's about understanding what people are searching for online, the answers they are seeking, the words they're using and the type of content they wish to consume. So that's coming from um, one of the top leading authorities on SEO in the world. And it draws many parallels, I think, with I suppose what user experience designers are thinking about, which you know, it's 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 not about a technology that delivers the website or or or, or the digital experience, but it's about understanding, I suppose, what people are expecting to get from that digital experience. What are they looking for? What are they trying to 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 uh, experience? Um, and if you understand that kind of fundamental behavioral level of, of of what people do with digital, why they do it, when they do it, um, you're beginning to start thinking about things in, in, in the same sort of terms as an SEO would think about things. They're also thinking about what people are searching for. When are they searching for it? Why are they searching for it? It's a very user-centered uh, practice. It has to be. So, uh, Let's look at the pervasiveness of Google. So in this section, I'm going to discuss how Google touches almost every part of our lives. It's everywhere. It's, it's encroached into our pockets, into our desktops, into every digital thing you could possibly imagine. And as Henry kind of said, in, as, he, as he introduced to me, one of my uh, my opening thoughts and my opening argument is you can't design inclusively if you neglect to consider the visitor that comes to your site like clockwork. And, and that visitor is Google. 
Google, uh, I know for a fact, because we've looked at the server logs of, uh, of the website here at Immensa, visits Immensa on a very, very regular basis, multiple times a day. Um, and I spend a lot of time looking at the Immensa website, um, along with many of my other colleagues. But what I can guarantee you is, is I don't look at it multiple times a day. And there's some days where I don't look at it at all. But I guarantee that Google will come to our website like clockwork and it will come to your websites and to your clients websites like clockwork so google is anthemeric and what anthemeric means is it is a brand that has transcended beyond being just a brand it's its name the noun has become a verb. So there's a few other examples out there of brands that have become antimeric, and um, here's just a few of them. So you don't vacuum the floor, you hoover the floor. When you're paying, paying the bill or sharing payment of the bill at the restaurant, you monzo your friend's contribution towards that. You don't get a taxi, you get an Uber. Skype me, teams me, FaceTime me. It's anthemeric. And, you know, we all say this pretty much every day. Let me Google that for you. And there's just, you know, just a, a visual example of some anthemeric experiences and brands. So Google is almost universal. I mean, the fact that it's transcended from a noun to a verb um, is, is a rare thing. But, you know, it does uh, touch so many aspects of our lives. Um, there's a few search statistics just to kind of put that into perspective for you. So Google properties own almost 90% of all searches out there. A question I often get asked about SEO is why do you always talk about it in, in terms of Google, I mean, there's other search engines out there like Bing and Duck, DuckGo and all of these other ones. But the reality is it, it, Google gets 90% of, of all searches that ever occur. So you might as well be really kind of focusing your attention there. There, there is benefits in, in thinking about the other search engines, but if you're following best practice from a Google perspective, you're predominantly following best practice for everybody's perspective. Google receipts, receives Two and a half trillion searches a year. I mean, that's an astronomical amount. It's getting 80 searches a second on any given day. And the average person searches around three to four times every single day. Um, I bear to can't bear to think how many times I've searched already today, probably 10, 15 times. Um, it's, it's just something that we do. Um, because of that, I would argue that almost every journey starts with a Google search. So in user experience design and experience design, you think about things in terms of journeys, in terms of customer journeys, in terms of user journeys. Um, if you are looking to catch a bus, if you're looking to buy some shoes, if you're looking to find uh, information about a school or a holiday or anything, it doesn't matter uh, where you end up purchasing that from or experiencing that from, I pretty much guarantee that you will have started that process of investigation um, with your phone in your hand, uh, doing a quick Google search. So, I mean, I ask you the question, how many searches have you already done today? How many searches have you already done or do in an average week? How many of those searches were brand specific versus generic? And what I mean by that is how many people searched for, let's think of an example, broadband versus uh, Sky or Virgin Media. Um, it's, it's interesting to think about things in this way. And these are the kinds of questions that I ask about search as I'm trying to deconstruct it. It's, it is pervasive. It is a fundamental step, a first step in, in so many customer journeys um, that you have to take it seriously and you have to consider it in the design process if you want to deliver success 
for your website and for your clients' websites. So in that last section, we explored how Google is an integral part of our lives and, and the beginning point for almost every customer journey, digital journey. In this next section, we're going to explore what is at the very core uh, of Google's success, uh, and that's the value exchange. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, the value exchange isn't really a concept that, that will be foreign to the design community. So what I'm, as I said at the start, it's trying to break this down into ways that, you know, make sense for people that aren't SEOs. So um, let's go and jump into the value exchange. So when thinking about deconstructing the value of an organization um, and how they operate and why they operate, a great model for doing that is uh, the Simon Sinek's golden circles. Um, so in order to kind of deconstruct the value exchange for Google, I uh, spent some time working out using the, the golden circles, the why, the how, the what of Google. Um, and uh, if we kick off with their mission statement, I think that kind of covers off uh, the what. So, uh, uh, sorry, the why. <laughs> Our company's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, which is quite a bold statement, but I would argue that they're, they're working very hard to deliver that and are being very, very successful at it. You could argue, actually, that their uh, core focus is to drive revenue, is to deliver value to their shareholders. And uh, it's very difficult to argue against that as they are one of the most successful companies on the world. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think what is interesting is that, you know, they, they do mention making information universally accessible. And that's something that Google works very hard to deliver is, is accessible solutions and accessible in, in, in a sense that um, regardless of your ability to use the internet, you should be able to use Google to access information. And when you get that information, that information should be useful to you. So we've looked at the why, the mission statement of Google. What we're gonna do now is kind of look at how they break that down into value for creators. And by creators, I mean people that are building websites, are creating content, and are publishing information and uh, entertainment, um, just putting stuff on the web. Um, and this is another, another great tool that designers use, um, which is called the, the value proposition uh, canvas. Uh, and this canvas is a really great way of kind of breaking down um, the various aspects of, of what uh, Google does and, and demonstrating how it creates value for the creators. So um, if you start over on the right hand side and focus on, on the customers and you think about the big the, the website owners, um, if we think about it from a commercial perspective, the, the job of a website and, and the website manager is to kind of increase revenue, is to ensure that they do that and manage the budget well, and really kind of demonstrate an impact or a return on investment of all the time and energy that's that's spent on, on, on a website. Um, what they gain uh, as a customer from, from uh, visibility in Google is, uh, potentially customers, partners, advocates, all sorts of people that are prepared to uh, purchase from them or, or, or uh, tell the world about how great they are, which generates, uh, is delivered by traffic uh, and generates revenue for the company. 
one of the challenges are that, you know, because this is seen as such a great route to customers, because it is the first step in the customer journey, um, there's a huge amount of competition to be found, to be visible, to be the results that people are clicking on. Um, and it's very easy when you're dealing with um, marketing and digital uh, to, to misplace your budget and not necessarily see the return on investment that you want. So if we go over the other side, in terms of the value proposition against their customers, they, Google provides a couple of, or three great services. They've got AdSense, AdWords, and Analytics. So AdSense is the ability to kind of monetize your website. So if you were a publisher, you can host uh, information, host adverts, um, the traffic you would get um, will generate a revenue for you. Uh, you can um, buy position from Google in terms of AdWords. So that's a great revenue generator for Google. And tying all of this together is, is analytics, which will kind of help um, the, the website owner demonstrate that return on investment. And this, this ecosystem that Google creates and provides for, for publishers to succeed in um, is, is really transparent, well supported. There's a huge amount of documentation out there about uh, how to get the best out of this relationship. Uh, and, and what they're doing for, for the customers is, is generating traffic, sending, sending users to their website, which we're all interested in if we want to be successful from, from digital. But the other side of the equation that we're going to have a look at is, is, is the search of value. So if we start again on the right-hand side and think about it from a, from a searcher's perspective, that customer segment, we're looking for information, entertainment. We're looking for products to buy or to, to locate services. The fact that we can pull a, a device out of our pocket and, and enter into that process pretty much anywhere in the UK um, wirelessly is a huge time saving. I remember the times before the internet when you had to go to the library to look up information or go and find an encyclopedia. Um, it, it, to be able to have the world's information universally available to you in your pocket is, is a fantastic innovation, definitely. Um, the results are personalized to a degree. It's free to use. But the, the, the other side of the fact that it's free to use is the user becomes the product. So whilst we're searching, we're providing all sorts of behavioral information to Google about what we like, what we don't like, uh, and that enables them to then potentially put adverts in front of us um, when we're searching. And, uh, and that balances off the other side, the creator side, uh, and the need to deliver to their shareholders and to be commercially viable. So in order for uh, searchers, to keep going back to this space, you know, they need to have good quality results. They need to be structured well. They need to be easy to understand. They need to be trusted. Um, and they need to have a good variety of information. So you're not necessarily presented with one result, but millions of results. It's just the hierarchy of it uh, is determined by what Google thinks is the best result for you. Uh, it's accessible, it's flexible, it's inclusive, and it's all publicly available digital information. So as a resource, it provides a huge amount of value to searchers, and it's delivered in a way um, that meets our expectations. And as a result of that, because they're continuously meeting our expectations and delivering us with the information, the right information at the right time in the right device in the right format, um, we keep going back to Google. We keep feeding this machine. So there's this kind of symbiotic relationship, this value exchange that Google sits slap bang in the middle of between the searcher and the creator, the need for the creator to have their information um, reach people, to be read, to be consumed, to be acted on, 
and there's a, a huge desire for us as human beings for information, uh, an insatiable desire for information. And, and Google sits in the middle of that exchange uh, and very successfully monetize, monetizes that behavior and that handoff between the creator and the searcher. And they can only do this by, as I said, delivering experience excellence at an incredible scale um, if they did not provide reliable, accessible, valuable for creators, businesses, and searches, it just would not have seen the continued success it has. Somebody else would have come up with this uh, magic benefit and disrupted um, Google from the offset. They'll have discovered the, the, the value that uh, fantastic experience design delivers from a commercial perspective and, and profited off it first. But you know, how does Google even know what value is? It's a machine, right? Um, how does it know what value is? How does it know what's meaningful to me so that it can keep providing me with information that meets my expectations every single time? Well, let's explore that in a little bit. So, meaning is quite a, an interesting subject matter and you could do a whole webinar specifically on meaning but if we think about it in this case meaning is about understanding what something is and the value that it brings to you and in order to do that you need context so if you look at this image that's on the screen at the moment you're probably asking the question what is it what does it mean and it's difficult to tell because where's the, where's the information in that picture to provide you with context, to help you understand, to give it meaning? It's, you're too close. You can't see what it is. And if you think about this in digital terms, it's kind of the equivalent of a call to action on, 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 a, on a button on a buy now button. So you've just got the call to action. You can't see that it's a button. There's text there that says buy now. You've got no idea that it's a buy now button. You can't see what it relates to, what product or service you're buying, when it's gonna be delivered. So you kind of need to move back a little bit further to be able to get context of, of what that tiny little component on a website means. So if you step back a little bit further, it starts to provide, show you patterns that, that, that have meaning, that provide you with an opportunity to kind of recognize what it is. And, and what this is, is, is that was a microscopic view of an oak leaf. And as you step back and further, you start to see those patterns. Oh, yeah, it's an oak leaf. So this is where the button starts to make sense, where you start to see what that button relates to. Um, because you're getting more and more context as you go further and further back. And as you go back even further, you start to see that those leaves, you know, are combined to make up another structure. And that structure is an oak tree made up of many, many leaves, branches, roots. It's almost an ecosystem in its own sense. Um, think about that in terms of a website that contains many, many components, many, many leaves. Um, and as you step further and further back, those components come together, the connections between them become clearer and you start to understand what the whole is. Um, meaning is a really tricky one. But then if you go even further back, think of this like the whole website, oh, not the whole internet, the tree is the whole website. This is the whole internet where you've got a whole forest full of trees, full of information, full of digital components. Um, Google's kind of looking at all of these different levels, right from the microscopic up to the whole of the internet. It's got this information stored on servers and it's looking for the connections between them to be able to get context of what things are so it can understand what that button is and where it sits in the hierarchy of 
meeting my expectations. And when you can see the whole forest, you can understand which trees are going to be most interesting to, to people. Where do, where do they want to go? What walks do they want to go on through this forest? What experiences do they want to have? So uh, just to kind of put that into context, so Google is looking at the whole of the internet, it's indexing the whole of the internet, and it's making it available for all of us to find uh, and, and access through these devices in our pockets. This graph just kind of shows you the relationship between, uh, I suppose, the point at which Google launched and uh, the number of websites that exist. And as you can see, sort of 1995, not very much. Google launched in 1998. And then from that point forward, as people realized they could find information, lots and lots of websites cropped up providing information. And Google kind of sits there in the middle, um, uh, guiding everybody, signposting everybody to the right information. Um, and I think that's really kind of interesting that that, that growth took place um, so quickly after Google came into existence. So we just to kind of explore how the value exchange and, and how focusing on experience, and delivering an exceptional experience in multiple directions has propelled Google into one of the most valuable companies in existence. Um, we're now going to explore how search works. Um, and we're going to do that in a way that kind of demystifies it as a dark art and help you to understand it from a designer's perspective. Um, and we're going to start that off with just a little video from Google. So here we go. Hi, my name is Matt Cutts. I'm an engineer in the quality group at Google, and I'd like to talk today about what happens when you do a web search. The first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, you aren't actually searching the web. You're searching Google's index of the web, or at least as much of it as we can find. We do this with software programs called spiders. Spiders start by fetching a few web pages. Then they follow the links on those pages and fetch the pages they point to and follow all the links on those pages and fetch the pages they link to and so on until we've indexed a pretty big chunk of the web many billions of pages stored across thousands of machines. Now, suppose I want to know how fast a cheetah can run. I type in my search, say cheetah running speed, and hit return. Our software searches our index to find every page that includes those search terms. In this case, there are hundreds of thousands of possible results. How does Google decide which few documents I really want? By asking questions. More than 200 of them, like, how many times does this page contain your keywords? Do the words appear in the title, in the URL, directly adjacent? Does the page include synonyms for those words? Is this page from a quality website, or is it low quality, even spammy? What is this page's page rank? That's a formula invented by our founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, that rates a web page's importance by looking at how many outside links point to it and how important those links are. Finally, we combine all those factors together to produce each page's overall score and send you back your search results about half a second after you submit your search at Google. So that's a really good, informative, short video out there about how search works and the interconnectedness of everything uh, to provide this context about what a particular page or a component on the page is about. Uh, and I would urge you to kind of have a good, good dig around the videos that are out there that have been produced by Google if you want to understand SEO a little bit better because they've got some great content out there. But, you know, it's not all driven by machines. I mean, obviously to do this at scale requires some very, very powerful computing um, and some very powerful algorithms. Um, but these algorithms need to be kind of kept in check and they need to uh, ensure, again, to be able to deliver that exceptional experience to, to, to searchers, that the pages that are, the algorithm is choosing to put at the top of Google are, are good. And, and the way that they do that is they have a team 
um, called the, the Search Quality um, Team. And they are an external team that audits, manually audits pages uh, on the basis of, of this model here in front of us, which is um, called Expertise, Authority and Trust. And it's about validating um, the algorithm and making sure that, that it continues to deliver quality. So let's kind of explore that a little bit now. So expertise, it's an expert skill or knowledge in a particular field. Um, how do we demonstrate that from a visual perspective or, you know, in terms not so SEO-y? Um, let's think about it in terms of this. I need a doctor. Um, there's many, many doctors on the internet. Um, this could be quite a valid response to that question, but I think unless you are, are looking for an expert in the space-time continuum, which is very unlikely, um, actually what you're probably looking for is uh, an expert in medicine. And um, one of the ways that Google will determine what is an expert to put in front of you is, you know, do they have credentials? Does their website follow the same patterns that other medical expert websites does? Is it being referenced uh, by other websites? Is it being um, used and cited uh, as a source of valuable information? Uh, are there news stories about this particular doctor? Um, these are the kinds of things that Google is, when it's got that perspective of the whole forest and it can see what everything is in there, it's, it's able to cross-reference and triangulate so that it can understand actually what you're not looking for is an expert in space-time continuum, um, but you're looking for an expert in medicine and, and this would be a, a a, a good result to put in front of you. Authoritative. So able to be trusted as being accurate or true or reliable. So trust is something that the design community works very hard to ensure that they incorporate in their work. If you're purchasing a product from a website, uh, you need to trust that that website is gonna deliver your product and not take your money away from you. Uh, you need all sorts of trust to be communicated to you as a user to, to encourage you to, to, to use that website and have a good experience. Um, or authority, how do you demonstrate authority? So most authoritative family in the UK, you could be thinking about these guys. Or you could be thinking about these folks. Um, when I look at it, there's lots of context that kind of suggests that actually if you, well, these guys are, are far more authoritative than, than these folks, um, you know, the way they dress themselves, hold themselves, the medals that they have, there's lots of visual cues that we are able to interpret that, that um, Google is taking from, from other things. How many times, uh, uh, is this particular uh, family referenced? I should imagine quite a lot on the internet. So they're seen as authoritative. Trustworthiness, back to trust. The ability to be relied on or as honest or truthful, you have to be able to rely on a website to do what it's delivering or, or you have to, it has to meet your expectations. Otherwise you don't have a good experience. You will, you will go away from it and you will tell others or you will never return to that website again. I mean, think about that in these terms. So, you know, I need to get over the Avon Gorge. Obviously we're a, a Bristol agency. We can't get through a, a webinar without mentioning something like the Avon Gorge or, or this particular fella here, Brunel's Bridge. So if you need to get over the Avon Gorge, this is a very well trusted uh, seen as authoritative um, way of getting across that bridge. It's got hundreds of thousands of cars and pedestrians traveling over it all the time. Um, if you were to decide, you know, which way you wanted to get across that bridge, it would be a, a good candidate. So, you know, if, if in digital terms, it may well have lots of positive five-star Trustpilot scores, against it that will give you 
uh, the confidence to use that bridge and know that you're not going to fall into the gorge hundreds of meters below. Um, things like Trustpilot uh, are things that Google will find. It will sit in that forest somewhere and, and they'll be looking for it and taking note of it that people trust this particular way to get over the bridge. Especially when you compare it to something like that. Now, it's a bridge. It'll get you over the Avon Gorge, no doubt, if it was there. Um, but which one are you going to go with? You're going to go with the one that gives you the five stars, that gets the lots of traffic, that sees people moving over it all the time, versus this particularly rickety looking thing on the right. So Google's team, its algorithm is thinking about and balancing off, you know, what it finds across the web in these terms, in terms of expertise, authority, and trust. And if you take those to mind in your design process, which you should be doing if you're a good designer and you're trying to uh, create something that meets the expectations of your user, you're already kind of working in a way that, that works well for, for Google and will deliver positive results from an SEO perspective. So let's think about uh, this little fella here, the search box. It, as I may have already mentioned, it, it for me is, is a very clever tool for answering questions. It's, I mean, what do you need? What are your intentions? What are you looking for? What has brought you to this box? What questions do you have that need answering? Um, and it's all about intent. Google is effectively rendering intent. When you look at the results in the search engines, it is a graphical representation of Google's interpretation of what you were intending to ask for. And it's basically falls into these, these, these ones here, who, what, when, where, why, how. These are all the kinds of questions that Google answers very, very well. For example, how do I cook lasagna? Where is Bristol? What is a cassowary? Let's deconstruct some of these. Uh, let's have a look at, you know, how does this actually work in Google? So let's have a look. What is a cassowary? You can see there as well, now that we're in the search, it's already dealing with the fact that I can't spell and uh, anticipating the question that I might be asking. So what is a cassowary? Um, which is quite a broad question, but it's now automatically kind of coming up with, you know, actually, these are other things that you might want to understand about cassowaries um, that may not have immediately um, answered that question, but these may be, associated questions, cassowary egg, cassowary attack. Why is the cassowary so dangerous? Can a cassowary kill you? It most definitely can. Um, and what it's doing is providing you with a very rich experience of information about uh, cassowaries in a way that it feels best matches your intent, which is to find out what a cassowary is. So it's providing you with pictures, information and it's dragging this from from all over the internet and basically producing this 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 uh what they call is a search engine results page rich and full of information about what a cassowary is anticipating what your need, next needs may, may well be uh and and putting that information in front of you uh it's delivering on your expectations, it's delivering a fantastic experience that encourages you to come back. And in order for it to deliver that fantastic experience, it needs to be absolutely uh, confident that the top result is going to meet your needs. So if I want to know what a cassowary is, it's no surprise that the top result is a Wikipedia page that takes you in and explains it in great depth and in a way that really kind of meets my expectations as to providing me with all the information I could possibly need about a cassowary. So Google is really kind of making sure that me as a user, uh, I'm satisfied 
with my search experience so that when I come back and ask more questions, uh, I will continue to keep coming back and back again. And, and that provides an opportunity for, for them to put advertising over here. Uh, for them to monetize that experience. Um, and I would encourage you, if you really kind of want to understand um, SEO, to, to spend time looking at Google and how is it generating the results? What are the kinds of things it's anticipating? Um, how does your website support these questions that are being asked and how does it deliver that experience if you want to be the top result in google you need to be the best answer uh, available uh, right let's see if i can get this webinar working again or this presentation so uh there's a thing called the index that google builds um we're going to rattle through this because I do appreciate that I've taken a long time to get to this point, but there's so much information about SEO. Can a search engines use your site? Cool, accessible, can search engines use your site? So um, it's called the World Wide Web because, you know, everybody thought that these connections looked like a web. And as a result of that, um, the bots that Google sends around the internet to research everybody's websites are called uh, spider bots. And it's really, really easy to um, block Google's spider bots with, with some, a small bit of text that will prevent them from coming into your website. And if you want Google to put your website into the search engine results, it needs to be able to come into your website and, and move around it and experience it and measure it uh, and understand mm what value it will deliver for their users. I realized I just jumped in and didn't really explain this model. This model is another one from Moz, uh, and this is the hierarchy of SEO needs. And it's a really good way of kind of understanding and breaking down um, from the bottom what Google needs, the ranking essentials, and how as you move up through, through the hierarchy um, to what human needs and how to become more competitive on the web. And I definitely recommend you to, to kind of Google that. And have a look for it. Um, content is a big factor, obviously. So once Google's been able to get into your website and have a move around and, and experience it, um, what content sits on that website? Is it authoritative, relevant, trustworthy? Is it perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust? And I think perhaps the best way of explaining that is this little video here. Four candles. Four candles. Here you are. Four candles. No, uh, four candles. Well, there you are. Four candles. No, four candles. Candles for forks. <laughs> It's really easy to get misunderstood um, and the impact of that can be quite tricky. So you need to make sure that your content is, is easy to understand and, uh, and interpret because uh, if your users are having, struggling interpreting what you're trying to communicate, then Google definitely will. Um, one of the ways that you kind of make it understandable and get that hierarchy of information on pages to use, you know, make sure that you've got your h1s and your h2s in place and you've got them correct so uh that helps google to understand for example this website you can see the h1 is uh highlighted there it's a little widget that you can use to show you um what's on a page 
And if you kind of look through, it gives you the hierarchy of information. It helps Google to understand what is on the page and the order and importance of the stuff on the page. Um, so you can see there, you've got your H2s and all back. And that's really just part of that process of giving context to this object uh, in a way that, that works for Google. And it also works really well from an accessible perspective. And I think uh, my colleague, Alistair Campbell, always kind of talks about Google in terms of being a blind user. And um, if you're building accessible websites to meet the needs of everybody, um, you're building a website that actually makes it very easy for Google to interpret and navigate around as well, because it can't really see what it's doing. Language. So kind of moving on from that, that process of making sure that you understand, you need to understand what people search for when they look for your products and services. If you can understand the, the most, uh, the thing that people put into Google the most that brings them to you as an organization or to your products and services, and you can build content around that, uh, you're already a step ahead. Uh, if, when somebody searches for a particular thing, Google will look for that thing, the best match. And if the best match is, is the way that you've written your content and you've matched exactly what they're searching for, uh, then, you, then you're winning. And a good way to kind of demonstrate that is, is think about it in terms of this. So this guy, a color distribution coordinator. No, he's a painter and he also paints and decorates. There's no point in building a website for a color distribution coordinator nobody searches for that they search for painters and decorators so build content around painting and decorating and make that content and experience a really valuable one that's really annoying isn't it so Does your page deliver great UX? Does your site deliver great UX? Does it take a long time for your pages to load? Are users having to wait for images to drop into your website? These are things that Google is measuring on your website constantly and determining whether when they send somebody to your website, it's gonna take way too long for, for that page to load. And you think about it, Google, if you've gone to Google to find a website, and then you click through from that website to the website and it didn't meet your expectations and you bounce straight back out of that website into another Google search because of the cookies that Google's got on your browser. And because Google Analytics is sat on that website, it's got both sides of those journeys. It can understand the quality of the experience that it just delivered you by putting that click, uh, putting that link in front of you and the fact that you bounce straight back out. If you're doing that consistently because you've got things like this all over your website or it's taking too long to load, Google will recognize that and it will bring you down in the search engine results and it will bring people that are delivering a better experience up. So delivering a great experience, making sure your tax stack is absolutely on point and your fast, fast web pages uh, is really, really important uh, and is definitely a ranking factor for Google now. Is it share worthy? Um, so we're kind of moving move more and more up the pyramid now. Is it share worthy? Um, Google recognizes uh, because it's got that perspective of the whole internet, you know, what's being shared around link wise across Twitter, across Facebook, across all of these other platforms, because it's got access to them. It can see uh, what's trending at the moment, what's important to people. Uh, and how that relates to your website. Um, so when you're building content, ideally you wanna make it share worthy. You wanna make it so that people will also work for you and draw attention to you because Google will pick up on that. Is it humanized? So this is the best image I could find in terms of thinking, is it humanized? Um, and what I mean by that is, your URLs um, in terms of readability. There's a huge amount of websites out there 
um, that it's difficult to understand what the URL relates to. So this is a really good one. Um, and when that URL is put into the search results pages and people are clicking through on it, you want them to understand where they're going. You want to help, help their expectations. So you, by using words in your URLs and really kind of spelling out what that destination is, as well as the descriptions that sit under it in the results, um, you, you, you're delivering a great experience. Google will, will uh, take that into account and you probably see a higher click-through rate as a result. Um, some websites kind of introduce uh, little bits of text and code like this. So not great, but it's moving in the right direction. It's, it's worse or better than this, which is, you know, how on earth is anybody going to be able to understand what that URL actually relates to uh, and, and be confident that when they click on it, they're going to end up where they need to be. Um, these are the kinds of things that you can do to really kind of encourage that click through rate uh, and, and help Google to understand the context of what that URL is about and your users. Fundamentally, it's always about helping your users. Schema. So right at the top of the pyramid in terms of human needs and competitiveness, schema does a site page use schema to give additional context about its purpose to algorithms. So if you remember back to when we were looking at cassowary, search results. There was images, there was all sorts of information from Wikipedia, there was video results. Um, it draws that from schema and it builds up that information. Um, it's a good way to think about schema is it's, is it's a cognitive framework that helps to organize and interpret information. So Google is using schema on websites to understand the relationship between the components at a deeper level than perhaps you get from just the links that exist around the internet. Um, there's schemas in, in the social world as well. We will we have personal schemas, social schemas, event schemas. Um, schema in digital uh, is really kind of what, as I say, helps to bring this rich information that you can see on the right uh, when you do a search for somebody like Harrison Ford uh, it gives you his date of birth, his height, all sorts of stuff like this that, that um, Google is using to build up its knowledge graph and provide you with the best experience. So by helping Google to understand what your content is and how it relates to other stuff, you're helping it to deliver a better experience to its users. Uh, and this is just kind of uh, a great little example, a diagram of the knowledge graph and the interconnected stuff of things. So you might start looking for Harrison Ford, but you can see, you know, it's recognizing him as Han Solo, male, Star Wars, Blade Runner. And, and off you go down these various different rabbit holes of information and relatability, but it all helps Google to understand uh, what to deliver you in that search result. So as we get into the final section of this website, I want to kind of cover off, I suppose, that, okay, if Google is a user, what do you do with that information? And, and, and how do you bring that into your design process so that you can build websites that deliver um, good levels of traffic and high levels of visibility? Um, so I introduce you to these folks. These are some, some examples of personas that we use here at Lamensa. Um, and we include Google in, in that lineup. We have a, a persona specifically for Google to help us uh, bring it into the design process and make sure that we're meeting its needs. So how do you represent its needs in the design process? So you need to create a benchmark uh, a snapshot uh, or a study of how much traffic a website is currently getting, um, how visible is it is, how many sales are being generated. You need to kind of understand the quant of the website so that if you're going to make changes and you want to see an impact from an SEO perspective, what is the, what, what, what's happening? Um, understand what people are searching for. Google's job is to deliver that great experience to their users, to deliver uh, the best answer to the question that they're asking, to, to render their intent most accurately. Uh, and if you understand what your user's intent is, 
when they're sat in front of that search box and they're looking for what you do, uh, you are a long way to being able to develop the content that you need to, to meet that expectation. Understand what Google needs. So we've kind of gone through that hierarchy of needs. We, 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 we've covered off that, you know, their job is to deliver an exceptional experience many, many times. And in order to do that, they really have to understand the needs of their users. And in order to do that, they have to kind of really accurately emulate the needs of their users, which is why they visit websites so regularly, which is why they're crawling over the internet and they're constantly measuring the impact of the results that they put in front of people. Create a persona. Write user stories for Google. So if you consider Google to be a user, then you need to start using, writing some user stories for Google. And I'll chuck some, in, uh, some examples in a minute. Uh, but fundamentally, if you're aiming to deliver a positive impact to a website, you need to measure the change. You need to have that benchmark in place. You need to return to it on a regular basis and see that you're moving in the right direction. And if not, why not? Um, what's delivering the results, what's not delivering the results. And that can really kind of help and inform your design process. Um, as I mentioned, we have this persona at the Mensa, and, and this is just a great example of, of how, we, how we treat Google. Um, so I would say this, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. And I argue vehemently that, you know, as Google has to deliver this exceptional experience to its users, it has to work like a user and understand how your website is experienced by their users. Um, so if you're working really hard to deliver an exceptional experience to your users, Google will recognize that. And this is where that parallel between SEO and experience design exists. If you're focused on the needs of the user, you're focused on the needs of Google as well. And as a result of that, you will see great results. Uh, and a really good way to ensure that that's kind of delivered into the design process, as well as personas, as well as benchmarking and understanding search is, is as I said, um, user stories for Google. So here's just a couple of examples. As a search engine, I want to, so that I can, a standard design tool that we use all the time. As a search engine, I want to access the site so that I can include it in the index. If they can't get into the website, if Google is blocked from your website because of whatever security reasons you've got in place, or you forgot to do your robots text properly, or you didn't have a sitemap in place, a correct sitemap, it can't access the information so it can index it. Speaking of sitemaps, it needs, as a search engine, I want to find a sitemap so that I can understand the structure of the site and pages. It needs to be guided around. As I said, consider Google to be a blind user. The way it works stuff out is by following links around from other websites into pages and through your navigation and from the sitemap. It works out and reads those pages and stores the information on them. As a search engine, I want to navigate around the site so I can visit every page and explore the content. So again, they will come into your website and they will try and move around it as a user would do. They would follow the links on the navigation um, and they will understand the hierarchy of the information that exists on your website on the basis of where, how easy it is to navigate from, uh, from, from, the, from the navigation. As a search engine, I want to understand the value each page holds and what it relates to so that I can understand what searches to place it in. So you, you need to get your taxonomy right. You need to get your uh, tagging right. You need to uh, ensure that the content is in a format that makes it readable to Google uh, and that it's able to understand it. Uh, in, in a sense that it understands anything, 
um, so that it is able to put it in front of uh, the right user at the right time in the right format. And user stories uh, are a really powerful way to make sure that the little things that make a big difference in SEO don't get overlooked as part of that build process. Understand, as a, as a search engine, I want to understand the hierarchy of content on the site and pages so I can direct my users to the right information. It's all about information. The parallels between information architecture and SEO are, are very, very close. The parallels between delivering um, and meeting user experiences are very, very close. And on that note, I will stop talking about the wonderful world of SEO. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. Some, yeah, some really, really useful stuff in there. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do submit them now using the Q&A box. I think we've probably got time for one or two. Um, so yeah, please do submit them now. Um, but firstly, Pete, um, kind of where would you recommend um, find kind of some more information about SEO, especially from a kind of designer's perspective? That's a really good question. I would suggest the obvious answer is to Google it. Uh, <laughs> But as, as, a, as, a, as a profession, as an industry, SEO is about being found on the internet. It's about demonstrating expertise, authority, and trust. So uh, as, as a profession, they're not shy in sharing um, their understanding and providing great resources for people to, to uh, learn about what they do, because that's how they become visible and known within 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 what they do. So uh, I would definitely have a good good Google. Um, but I mentioned Moz quite a few times. They've got some really great resources that will help you to kind of understand SEO. They've got the SEO 101 of SEO, which is a set of structured courses that will take you through it. And, and I think if you're in if you're involved in digital, if you're involved in design and you start working through that, you'll start to see the parallels. Uh, SEM Rush is a, a, another platform out there. Many of the tools that are out there that support SEO will, will have guides and, and great information. And it's trustworthy. It has to be. Otherwise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be at the top of the Google results. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, I can't see any more questions. Um, however, if anyone watching... Um, wants to ask Pete any questions on LinkedIn. Uh, you're just, just Peter K on LinkedIn, that's right. And That's right. And I'm also on Twitter as well, as not from Bolton. Uh, feel free to, to uh, tweet me any questions as well, and I'll do my best to answer them. Brilliant. Cool. Um, so, yeah, thank you. So, just, yeah, just a reminder to everyone um, that next week is Interact Global, the virtual offering of our annual conference, Interact. Um, so, we've got a week of top design talks, interviews, and panel discussions covering accessibility, research, UX design, strategy, innovation, leadership, and pretty much everything in between. Um, signing up uh, is free. Um, so, yeah, head on over to our event page and register for that if you haven't um, already. Um, and our next webinar is being held on the 19th of October, um, and that's hosted by uh, Louisa Federico, our principal UX consultant here. Um, and uh, that webinar is called 20 Tips for a Happier Work Life. And uh, yeah, it does pretty much exactly what it says in the tin. Um, Signups for that are now open. Um, so yeah, you can register for that also. Um, and yeah, we'll tweet out links to kind of both Intra and Louisa's webinar shortly. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll see some of you back for Interact Global next week. Um, thanks again to you, Pete, for a great presentation. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.